Hello, this is Dr. B, and we are doing the flood module in the Concord Consortium. This is part of the Earth Science Activities under Project Geode. Um, it's part of the Natural Hazards series, and we are studying natural hazards, one of them being floods. In this introductory activity, we're investigate the phenomenon of inland river flooding and are introduced to four key factors that influence flooding with the flood diamond. Using the Flood Explorer model, which is a simulation, you will investigate the first factor, topography. You'll also begin to examine real-world data on the frequency and extent of flooding in the Midwestern part of the United States. So, let's go. We can navigate with um, these buttons up here, and this last page here is very important for downloading your work. Um, the first page is just um, some demographics, um, your experiences with flooding, what's your current grade, I think you can do okay with this, um, how you feel about science, I'll let you do those. You can pause the video and come back to this video. Uh, pause the video, answer these questions, and come back. According to the World Health Organization, floods are the most frequent type of natural disaster. And if you lived in the Midwest, you know that they um, happen just about every spring somewhere. Um, they are among the planet's most destructive natural hazards. Flash floods are very, very, uh, can come without warning and sweep away anything in their path. Floods can occur near the coast or inland near rivers. Floods can spread close to places where people live and work, bringing dangerous currents and deep water to usually dry neighborhoods. Floods can be deadly to the people and animals in their path. In this module, you'll learn more about factors that affect river flooding and the ways the people in their communities can reduce their risk of flood damage. And we're also going to look at how we can predict flooding. You can also learn about floods in the past and think about how floods may change the future. The five activities in this module will help answer the guiding question. How will river flood risks and impacts change over the next hundred years? This helps us plan where we want to live and it helps city planners know where to put important buildings which shouldn't be in the floodplain, obviously. You don't want a hospital or a school to flood. Watch a video that describes the 2019 floods of the Midwest and the United States. Across the U.S. Midwest, heavy rain and snow melt have sent rivers over levees, submerging farms and whole neighborhoods in several states. William Brangham has our report. In Peru, Nebraska, National Guard trucks bring a lifeline, bottled water. Volunteers unload the water after flooding from the Missouri River shut down the town's water treatment plant. Fred Knapp of Nebraska PBS station NET was in Peru. Down here, there are about 10 houses that have been flooded by the Missouri River after a levee broke north of here. Across the state, roads, livestock, and hundreds of homes have been swallowed by floodwaters. It's devastating. It is devastating. Flooding began last week after a massive late winter storm hit. Water levels rose through the weekend, hitting those who live along the Missouri River the hardest. It's bad, bad as it gets, you know, you're starting all over. Lisa Lemus from Sarpy County is one of hundreds who had to evacuate when rising waters flooded her home. There is no words that can describe somebody's mental state when all this comes down. Rescuers and airboats came to save those who couldn't escape in time. Across the Midwest, floodwaters brought record river levels to 41 places, including 17 spots in Nebraska. The water reached seven feet in some areas. On the eastern side of the Missouri River, nearly 2,000 people have been evacuated across Iowa. Floodwaters destroyed roads, including parts of this bridge in Council Bluffs. Overflow from the Rock River in Illinois has inundated communities along its banks, and it could still get worse. Rain is in the forecast for Tuesday, and the Missouri River is expected to reach its highest level on Thursday. 
For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham. It's not just rain. Remember, snow melt is also an issue here in the Midwest. Rain on top of snow melts the snow very quickly, and that's one of the things that um, is almost most likely to cause flooding here. Um, so you can answer question eight now. It's based on the video. You probably have some pretty good ideas about what the correct answers are. And if you don't, you can always check your answer and keep working until you find the correct one. Question nine doesn't have a correct answer, but uh, even things like puddles or um, if you take another way around the block because there's a big pothole that's buried under a puddle, that's a type of flooding. Um, or on your way to school or your walk around the block, there's an area that's always low and full of water or there's a uh, squishiness in your park or your backyard. Um, those are things to think about because those are areas where water is pooling or standing and um, that's part of flooding. So scientists use many tools to monitor river levels, including maps, photographs, and models. And we're going to act like scientists and use those tools ourselves. Throughout this module, we'll use similar tools to investigate what factors influence the likelihood of damages and losses from flooding. With satellite images, scientists are able to take pictures of rivers from space, which is pretty cool. We can see these pictures down here. We're comparing the Missouri River in two different years. Here's 2018, river at a normal level. Um, and here's 2019, all this greenish, kind of dark bluish uh, places, those are places where the river flooded. So we want to click the button. Um, oh, well, enlarge the photograph first and then look closely and then you can come in, we'll choose a color here, and you can find areas in 2018 that were flooded in 2019. And obviously this is not a complete um, a collection of all the different areas that were flooded. I'll let you finish. And when you're done drawing, um, all the different areas kind of fill in the, the, the areas on 2018 that were flooded in 2019. Go ahead and uh, close, and that will automatically save your drawing in the question. Um, if you want to take a closer look before you make a drawing, you can um, pop out your drawing like that, and then you can just hit the X in the corner to make it small again. Think about the land features and flooded areas in this photo. Why do you think some of the areas of the land are flooded and some are not? Let's take a closer look at this picture here. What's in these areas that flood? Is it people's homes? Um, are there big hills? Are there a lot of structures? Are there businesses there? Or is it pretty flat and pretty farmlandish? Do we think these same areas are likely to flood in the future? Well, here's a clue. Nobody lives in the places, it looks like. There are not many structures here where it floods. These structures here where they put um, buildings and where people live are not where it flooded. That's over here um, in a place where it didn't flood. So that might give you a clue about the history of flooding in this particular area. So here's something very central to understanding how floods work. This is called the, the flood diamond and it involves four different things. Precipitation, any water that's coming out of the sky. So snow, we have a lot of that here in the Midwest. Rain, fog, 
Um, that's all water that can contribute to flooding. Permeability is how easy the water goes through. Right here, you can see kind of the sides of the simulation. You can see water ponding or kind of sitting in somebody's yard. Um, that soil probably has low permeability right now because it's saturated with water. If you pour water on sand, if you've ever been to the beach and you poured, you know, a container of water out on the sand, sand just sucks in water and goes right through. So sand is very permeable. Pavement, not so much. If it rains on pavement, it doesn't soak into the pavement. That's why we have gutters to pick up the water. Um, we have curbs and gutters and it goes down into the storm sewer. Water table is how deep the water is. There's, there's always water underground. Where that water is depends um, on how much precipitation there's been recently. The water table can be very high if there's been a lot of precipitation or can be very low if there's been a drought. It also depends on the area and the type of rocks. Topography are hills, valleys. It's the shape of the land. So think of looking down, think of the top of the Earth's crust, looking down from the top of the Earth's crust, and what are you seeing? Are you seeing mountains? Are you seeing hills? Are you seeing slopes? Are you seeing flat? So floods can be very dangerous. Human civilizations emerged along rivers because rivers flooded each year, depositing rich mineral soils and made these good areas good for farming. We saw with the Missouri River on the previous page that there were lots of farm fields uh, around the river. So maybe flooding is good for farming in some respects. In modern times, farms are still located on the banks of rivers, but so are many small towns and large cities. In fact, 50% of the world's population lives within five mil miles of freshwater lakes and rivers, probably even more here in Minnesota. Scientists have studied floods for many years and have learned what causes floods, how flood water spreads, and methods to protect communities from flood hazards. Scientists consider four main factors when they investigate flooding in a region. Each factor is part of the flood diamond. You'll learn more about e how each, each factor as you go through the activities in the module. So, um, you can answer this question on your own. Which of the factors in the flood diamond include information about the slope of the land? So which one is telling you, you're looking down, you're looking from the top, and you're trying to figure out the shape of the land? So now we're gonna look at a photo here. What do you think happens to rain when it falls on the top of the hills near the city? So there's rain falling here, there's rain falling here, there's rain falling on these hills. Does it turn to ice and snow? Does it flow down the mountains to the river? Does it soak into the ground or does it evaporate into the air? You can come up with your own answer and check it and keep trying until you get it correct. Let's go to page five here. Topography is one of the uh, pieces of the flood diamond. Topography shows the shape of the land. From a topographic map, we can identify features such as mountains, rivers, and valleys. Rivers flow through many different types of landscapes. Usually rivers start at a higher elevation like mountains or hills. Many smaller streams called tributaries can join together to form a larger river. Rivers always flow downhill. It doesn't matter what direction downhill is. Rivers always follow gravity. And eventually that river is gonna go into a lake or an ocean. Examine the graphic below that shows the flow of water from mountains to the ocean. In which zone do you think the water flows the fastest? Well, if you've ever ridden your bike or you've been on a sled, um, you know that steep downhills give you the most speed. So that's a clue for how to answer question 15. Which one is the steepest? And you can use that in your explanation for question 16. Think about 
steepness. Think about riding your bike or riding a sled or being in a car and going uh, down a hill. And which zone do you think flooding is most likely? So where's the water going to pool um, or the river going to overflow its <coughs> banks? There's not much place for the water to make pools here because this is very steep. But um, other zones are not quite as steep, so you can um, think about other zones and figure out what your answer to question 17 and question 18 are. Think about Iowa. Iowa has a lot of river flooding. Is Iowa known for mountains? Or is it known to be pretty flat and have a lot of farm fields? Okay, let's do page six. Let's look at this map here. And this map is kind of shows some topography. It shows um, that's a little bit higher here and there's something steep here. Um, there's a few kind of hills here. Um, this looks pretty flat. And we're, it's our job to figure out where it has the steepest slope and where it's relatively flat for question 19 and question 20. Um, I have a hard time figuring out topography on this map because as a hiker, I'm used to topographic maps. This is a topographic map of a state park I was in last week. Um, these lines show topography. And so um, a very steep cliff will have lines um, for different elevations very close together. You can see um, this cliff next to this lake and this lake is very steep. It's actually like a rock wall that goes straight up. And so you don't want to put a hiking path here. Um, and this area right in here is never going to flood because it's way above the water. Um, the lakes, you can see, um, are areas where it is going to flood. This is a pretty flat place, um, which is why they put the picnic area there. Um, you can see that the trail doesn't go up here. It kind of goes up a less steep area where those lines are a little bit further apart. Um, if we look at um, this part of the map, this shows a, a little bit of a mountain. It's not very tall. It's only 1,500 feet, but that's about as good as it gets in Minnesota. You can see this is the top of the mountain, and this is kind of the steeper parts. Um, this, these are the flatter parts of the map, and Lake Superior is kind of uh, down uh, away from this area that's very flat. So there are better maps that show topography in detail that shows how high the land is, like this is 1,300 feet, this is 1,400 feet, this is 1,500 feet. But this map is a little bit less informational, so we have to make a little bit more guesses. But we can kind of look for some shadowing here, and that gives us an idea of the topography. If there was a large rainstorm and the river water began to rise, which areas on the map do you think are going to flood first? Explain your prediction. What is it about the topography that made you choose this area as most likely to flood? Consider would, a, would water puddle on top of a mountain or would it run down the mountain and hang out where it's flat? Use your just common sense, your experience with how water moves in your world. Um, something to think about is if you turned on the kitchen sink full blast and the sink filled up, filled up and kept running down on the floor, the, your floor is relatively flat. Would the water just keep spreading out and flood the whole house if you kept it running? Obviously, don't do this. Don't do this experiment. It's a thought experiment. If you kept pouring water on your flat floor, would it keep spreading out all over the house? Yes? No? Think about it. Don't do it. Just think about it. That kind of thing has happened. Um, people uh, have gone away. A water pipe has burst and it's gone all over their home for days. 
On the previous page, you made a prediction about which areas would flood first if there's a big rainstorm in Silverton. Now it's time to see if your prediction is correct. We're starting to use models here. Models are another tool that scientists use to think about flooding and predict where floods might occur. You will use the Flood Explorer model to investigate the factors that affect flooding. We're going to watch the video below to learn how to use Flood Explorer. It's only two minutes, pretty informational. Or to familiarize you with the tools you can use. The model consists of a map visualization on the left and a graph tab on the right. You can zoom in and out on the map, as well as rotate it side to side and up and down. Click this button anytime you want to return the map to its starting position. On the bottom control bar, you can see several buttons and features. Going from left to right, you have an amount of rain slider, which adjusts the total amount of precipitation that will fall in a model run. Next is the storm duration adjuster, where you can set the length of the rainstorm from short to very long. Then you have the starting water level slider, where you can adjust the height of the water table. Next is a reload button, which will reload the entire page and put all the settings back to their original values. There's also a restart button, which will rerun the most recent flood simulation. Next, there's a start button, which you will need to click to start a rainstorm. It changes to a stop button so that you can stop the simulation at any time. Next to that is a time slider that you can use to go back in time after a simulation is started. Finally, there are four arrows in a box shape. Clicking on this button will make the model full screen. Now I'm going to run a big rainstorm. I'll set the initial conditions for the amount of rain, storm duration, and starting water level, and click start. There will be one sunny day before the rainstorm begins. Watch the weather box in the top left to see the weather and how many simulated days have passed since you hit start. The flooded area versus time graph shows the total number of acres flooded in the model as it runs. The time slider in the bottom right also tracks how much time has passed. You can stop the model and drag the time slider back in time to see previous conditions on the graph and on the map. The Flood Explorer also comes loaded with different map types. In the Maps tab at the top of the right window, you can see a street map and a permeability map option. Now you're ready to investigate the Flood Explorer on your own. Have fun! Okay, so we have to use Flood Explorer, or we get to use Flood Explorer. Uh, there's a big rainstorm on the way to Silverton. Set up Flood Explorer model to simulate a large rainstorm by adjusting the storm duration and the amount of rain to their highest settings. Click the Start button when you're ready to run the model. You may have to wait a second while the flood develops. Okay, here's Flood Explorer. We're going to click Rain all the way to Max, Amount of Rain, Storm Duration, Let's just go long, starting water level high. This is, let's say it's spring and all the runner, ri rivers are running fairly high because of snow melt and spring rainstorms. We're gonna start it. You can see it start to rain. And we managed to flood about 1,800 acres. And that stayed flooded for between two days two and days five. So five minus two, that's about three days. Did the area you predict on the prior page flood in the model? Well, let's go back and see we can go back in time here on our model. Go back to when the, it was kind of at its peak here. You can kind of see the water recede, the flood build up, and the water recede. You can use that slider there to go 
back and forth in your in time in your model it looks like um, this area here which was C um, on the previous page looks like it's pretty flooded more than one area on the map flooded explain why these areas flooded in addition to the one you predicted well Silver Mountain didn't flood because it's a mountain maybe it's not a tall mountain and these areas that look like they're kind of more hilly or maybe like a cliff here those didn't flood let's also look at the permeability map here just for fun permeability is whether the area is paved or unpaved um, oh, it looks pretty green so that's not really an issue here there's not a lot of pavement so let's go back to topographic this means hilly terrain this means flat terrain so I notice if I look at the flooded areas I don't see a lot of this kind of shading and bumpiness on the map so that might give you a clue about where things are more prone to flooding what is the maximum total area flooded well we got about up to 1800 so the closest number to that is 1900 approximately how many days probably about three and a half so that's about four the low-lying areas next to the river that fill with water after a large rainstorm are called floodplains and that's a huge um, when you go into biology it's a big deal in um, ecology they're called floodplain forests trees live in some places there are forests that can flood they're next to rivers and those trees can survive being flooded most forests cannot survive being flooded but there are certain trees and plants that can tolerate that a lot of times now those forests have been eliminated and everything is next to a river is agriculture because if your fields get flooded it brings silt um, from the river and that can renew your soil it can be a good thing but if that water sticks around too long you can't get in to do what you need to do on your fields and it, it effectively takes them out of um, you can't use them to grow crops so what are ways floods are changing over time as you've, you've seen this activity, topography is a very important factor in determining which areas will flood. The topography of the land changes very little through, throughout time, through human time. So uh, there's not going to be a big hill there and then next year the hill goes away. So the thing that changes in flooding is not the shape of the land, but how much water. using topography explain why some areas along the river flooded and not others so why did this flood but not the town why did this area flood but not the higher ground well i'm assuming it's higher ground over here i don't know for sure without looking at a topo, uh, topo map but i'm guessing because the water didn't get this far or didn't get this high um, it's a little bit higher than the river you can see that there are no buildings here which gives us a clue that the folks who live around there know that this um, this stretch of river has a history of flooding and so they don't put homes there they put farm fields or maybe they pasture cows there which can be moved if there's a flood um, maybe there's a barn there that can you know has concrete floors can tolerate a little bit of flooding um, but there's no nobody lives there so look at the satellite image to the right take snapshots and circle the areas that give evidence for your explanation so why do you think those areas flooded circle them and explain why and do you think they're gonna flood again explain why 
And there's clues there because they didn't, the folks who live there, the people who live in this, next to this river, didn't put buildings um, in the areas it floods. So they likely have had some history, some oral history passed down, maybe from people who lived there before, or maybe people wrote it down, or maybe they have satellite photos um, from earlier, and they understand what goes on when this river floods. And then explain why you are certain or uncertain about the areas of future flooding. So choose your certainty level here in question 31, and then explain your certainty level. Now, thing, no, nothing is guaranteeing in flooding. We don't know how much water. So how much water is gonna come down? You can put that into your uncertainty sort of calculation or level of uncertainty. Um, we don't know how people are going to change the river. Levees, which are uh, they're big sloping kind of hills that they build next to the river to kind of hold the river in can change the way the river uh, behaves downstream. So if there's levees upstream of you, if they're, if they're building levees um, upstream in the river, that may change the downstream flow. There may be more pavements. As cities get larger, there's more areas that don't absorb water. Um, the rain may come very quickly. You may get two inches of rain in an hour, or you may get two inches of rain in a week. So what's, what, how things are gonna flood or what's going to flood depends on a number of factors. And I just gave you some hints there. So let's talk about this map, this flood magnitude. Scientists collect past and current flood data to figure out what whether flood magnitude or size changes over time. They've done this throughout the United States. Take a look at the map below. This map shows the areas in the US that have experienced a change in flood size over the last 100 years. Larger triangles indicate an increase in flood size over time. So let's look at the key here. The larger the triangle, the, the bigger the floods are getting, if it's green. The brown triangles mean the flood, the, uh, the tendency to flood is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So here, if we see one of these large brown triangles, it's an 18% decrease in the chance of flooding. If we see one of these big triangles here, it means an 18% increase in the chance of flooding. So the Midwest overall has had an increase in flooding. There are a couple areas where it's decreasing. Also the Northeast here has an increase in flooding. The Southwest has had a decrease largely because there have been many droughts in the Southwest. You've heard about the California wildfires. It's largely because they're not getting enough rain. Um, there are wildfires in other parts of the country as well, and it's because they're not getting enough rain. And when you don't get enough rain, you can't flood. Which regions of the United States have experienced an increase in large floods? Well, that's the Midwest, that's where we live, and one other area, look for the green triangles. The topography of the U.S. did not change much in the last 100 years. We haven't leveled the Rocky Mountains, or take, we haven't um, built hills in the Midwest where we have nice flat land. If the topography is not changed, why are there changes in the sizes of the floods? Well, think about what comes out of the sky. 
and how quickly it comes out of the sky. Recently, we've had a lot of lot more storms that dump 15 or 20 inches of rain in an area in a day. That's a lot of rain. So um, that's a lot of rain coming down very quickly. It's very difficult for um, the the land to absorb that much rain that quickly. And so often we have flooding when that happens, when we have a lot of rain in a short time. What questions do you have about floods? Well, um, I have some questions about what is being done to warn me if there's a flood and how much of a risk am I in my house? Um, what risk of flooding is there in my neighborhood? I used to live right next to a levee next to the Minnesota River, and I know that that apartment had flooded before. I actually had a boat in my apartment, and my plan was to paddle out if there was ever a big flood. Not a probably a great plan, but um, it was a plan. And you should have a plan uh, in place if if there's a high risk of flooding in your neighborhood you should have an evacuation plan with your family. So once you've written down your questions, you can click this orange button at the end. That brings you to the um, summary of your work. I haven't written all the questions yet because I'm a teacher, but I can get to a page that's where I can show my work. And this is the page where your answers show up. Um, I didn't answer all of them you can see, is where you can upload this to um, Notability. You can use the triangle that looks like this, and you can click Upload, you can click Options, you can click PDF, and then click Notability. Thanks so much for watching. Um, this is Lesson 1 of the Flood Module, and we will um, continue doing the rest of the modules as well. Thanks so much for watching.